Hello, viewers. Welcome you all for one more session on applied science. Already we have completed one session. This is my second session. And in this session, we are going to study laser and nanotechnology. As you all know, light is emitted from different types of sources. And according to various theories, what we have for the atomic structure, atomic structure, it was given by Rutherford, then it was modified by Bohr, and so on and so forth. We have different structures, and the basic phenomenon which is happening in the emission of light is because of the major role played by an electron. We know for certain an atom consists of a central nucleus, which consists of protons and neutrons. And we know that electrons are revolving around the nucleus in different orbits. We have different orbits. The first orbit we say this K orbit, L orbit, M, N, and so on. Depending upon the number of electrons, we have different atomic structures. And the simplest one is your hydrogen atom, which consists of only one proton in the nucleus, and only one electron is revolving around the nucleus. And this electron, no doubt, at ordinary conditions, it can revolve around the nucleus in a definite orbit, which we call it as the stationary orbit. As long as the electron is revolving around this nucleus, no radiation is possible. No light will come out of the substance. But hydrogen, under certain conditions, the electrons, which are the single electron which is present there in the K shell, it can be excited to the next shell, namely from K shell, the electron can go to the excited state, the L is named as L. And if the energy is still higher, the electron can go to the next orbit. Some of you may wonder what is happening there. K shell corresponds to certain energy, which you call it as E1, energy corresponding to that is E1, whereas energy corresponding to the second orbit is E2, E3, and so on and so forth. When you say that electron is in the K shell, it will have only one energy, namely E1. It cannot have any other energy apart from E1, whereas if it acquires an energy by one or the other process, what we call is it, call it as maybe due to collision or due to some thermal process or by applying some field, the electron can be taken to the higher orbit. In other words, the electron is said to be promoted to the next orbit, namely L. But the electron cannot stay permanently in that orbit. Immediately, it will make a transition. So to say, when it goes from one orbit, that is a lower orbit to higher orbit, it absorbs energy. Whereas when it jumps from L orbit to K orbit, it has to emit the radiation or emit the energy in the form of radiation. And it can be easily understood by using energy level diagram. Instead of considering only one atom, if I have a collection of atoms, a group of atoms, all the atoms are said to be almost in the same state under a particular condition. When a hydrogen gas, for example, it consists of several n number of molecules, we can say n number of atoms, and the collection of all those uh, atoms corresponds to certain width, we call it as a band. So I can explain it with the help of a band theory, so this corresponds to K orbit, which is also called a ground state. The electrons normally 
of electrons let me consider only one electron just for simplicity this electron under normal condition it will be in the ground state whereas if it acquires or if you supply certain amount of energy the electron cannot remain in the same place on the other hand it will go to the excited state let me say this as excited state this corresponds to energy e1 this state corresponds to energy e2 when the electron makes a transition from ground state to excited state means it is possible only when it is given certain amount of energy at the same time the electron let us say it goes to the excited state but it is not a permanent state it is only a temporary state within no time the electron will make a transition it will come back to its ground state so by going it absorbs certain amount of energy while I, while it is returning it will give out whatever the amount of energy that is absorbed we don't find anything loss or a gain of energy if the energy whatever that is supplied is exactly equal to the difference in the energy level then we say that energy electron can be excited excited or it can go to the excited state it is not a permanent state it will make a transition immediately thereby it will emit radiation so why i have written this uh, simple signal there we say energy according to quantum mechanics energy that is light consists of packets of energy packet means definite amount of energy it is something like taking uh, milk in packets we don't compare one packet from the other and we don't select it by weighing it or by comparing it because we know for certain a particular packet for example if it is 200 ml it will consist of only 200 ml we will not go for any verification if it is half a liter packet several packets of the same size will have only half a liter in the same way packet of energy we say it is e it is given by h mu where h is called planck's constant and the mu corresponds to the frequency of the radiation already made of studied in electromagnetic radiation gamma rays have certain frequency x rays they have another frequency radio waves they have other frequency infrared and so on and so forth each and every electromagnetic radiation can have a definite packet of energy which is called photon that packet of energy is termed as photon and we say it consists of a quantum of energy quantum means a definite value a fixed value for this particular transition it absorbs a particular packet of energy which is taken as h mu similarly here the same amount of energy will be released and here we call this as spont uh, stimulated absorption that means the the electron is happily spending its time in the ground state but we are forcing the electron go to go to the excited state in other words we are stimulating the electron thereby the electron absorbs energy it will go to the excited state and the electron it cannot remain as i said it will come to the ground state it is only because it is a temporary state it will come back it will feel comfortable only in the ground state and while coming to this portion we say it is a spontaneous emission i'm going to give you a slide also we can understand in a better way this diagram may not be so comfortable for you so here i'm just explaining what are the what are the various possibilities that one can find an electron if it absorbs certain amount of energy it can be placed in the excited state here there may be several excited state but i am selecting only one in the same way other bands also can be explained and let me not complicate the situation let us think of the simplest one so if at all you want to learn something on laser so what is laser first of all we should know what is laser and what are the techniques that is adopted what is the principle that is used and what are the applications and what are the uh, various um, the uh, places where in which we can what are the various properties in other words so all the things we are going to study in this lecture now coming to first uh, heading that we find laser i've given you a simple illustration what are the possibilities 
for the study of laser. Without this basic idea, we cannot explain anything. So what are the things that we are going to cover up in this lecture? We are going to define what is a laser. We are going to absorb. We are going to find what is meant by absorption and emission of radiation. What are the different types of absorption and so on? And there is a term what we call it as population inversion, optical pumping. We are going to study some of the properties of laser and applications of laser. The first is what is a laser? The laser it stands for an acronym. In English, you must have studied what is known as an acronym. Simple example: H A L, Hindustan Aeronautical Limited. Similarly, you say that U N O, United Nation Organization, because we it is not giving you a meaningful word, whereas it stands for some sort of abbreviation. Similarly, laser stands for some abbreviation. What is that abbreviation? First. Let me explain what is that um, acronym: Light Amplification. Light Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. Light Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. We can easily make out L stands for light, A stands for amplification, S for stimulated, E stands for emission. And R stands for radiation. If you collect all those things, we find the word laser. Something like radar. When I say radar, immediately we can think of an airport or a defense and so on, wherein which it is a device wherein which radio waves are transmitted. Radio waves are transmitted. It will fall on some obstacle, maybe an airplane or some other target. And the waves will be reflected back, and it will be received by the same instrument. So, radar is an instrument, where in which there we use radio waves. Whereas here we are using simply in majority of the times we say that visible light, and in some cases we use ultraviolet radiation as well as infrared radiations also. So, when this light is amplified, what do you mean by amplification? And it is amplified by a simple phenomenon, which we call it as stimulated emission. What is that stimulated emission? We are going to study with the help of a simple slide there. So whenever the light is amplified by the stimulated emission of radiation, it is known as laser. So laser, it is a device wherein which light is amplified by the stimulated emission of radiation. So this uh, stimulated emission, the foundation was laid by a famous scientist, Albert Einstein. Somewhere in 1917, itself he is predicted, he proposed certain theories. So if you happen to see the achievements, the thoughts of Albert Einstein, famous scientist, it is marvelous. Because without having a telescope and other things, he said even the light waves can bend whenever it crosses across the massive substances. It may sound very awkward or funny or something astonishing. Light waves, they bend. That is the proposal given by Einstein. Not only that, he gave theory of relativity, the theory of general theory of relativity and the special theory of relativity, and explained the photoelectric effect for which he got Nobel Prize, and in the same way, he established, he proposed what is known as the stimulated emission. And later on, the scientists they developed, and uh, later on, finally, the, it was achieved in the laboratory to produce laser. So, what are the methods or how laser can be achieved, or how laser is produced, or how laser is formed? You can form any sort of uh, phrase. So now in the figure, we have a ground state. I've already explained it in the board. The electron is there in the ground state. And my aim is to bring it to the excited state. In order to do that, some amount of energy has to be radiated 
in the form of a packet of energy, in the form of a photon, which is nothing but a quantum of energy. So here, we say that it is approaching. I'm dividing it into different slots, different uh, stages, wherein which you can understand them in a thorough manner. Because such, such type of uh, explanation, I cannot give it on the board. So for that, I made a PowerPoint for you in order to understand what is happening. And later on, you can remember in your own style. So a photon, a packet of energy, E is equal to H nu, enters and it is absorbed by the electron. When it is absorbed by the electron, electron cannot remain in the same state. It will be taken to the excited state. So once it is excited, it cannot remain in the same place. It has to make a transition. What do you mean by transition? So this first one, we call it as stimulated absorption. What is absorption? It is absorbing energy. Electron, I told you in the beginning itself, it is mainly because of the uh, role played by the electron alone. Nothing to do with proton or neutron or any other thing. Electrons present in the atom. That to the electrons which are present in the outermost orbit. In most of the higher cases, we can say electrons which are present in the outermost orbit, they will be taken to the excited state. Once it is taken to the excited state, it cannot remain there for a longer time within no time, fraction of a second. In other words, we can say at once, all of a sudden, it will come back to the ground state. So this is the transition from excited state to the ground state. The two phenomenon, the first one, we call it as stimulated absorption. The electron is stimulated, it is absorb absorbing energy, it is taken to the excited state. So during the transition, once again, let me define it and tell you. So when the electron is transited, here we find a photon of energy is released. Which is that a photon? It is not the same photon. We can say the same amount is released. It is something like taking 100 for, uh, rupees from a person and returning him after some time need not be the same currency note. It can be something else, but the value remains the same. In the same way, the photon H nu is being absorbed by the electron and the same amount of energy is released when the electron makes a transition. And this happens, we call it as spontaneous emission. The first one we call it as stimulated absorption. The second one we call it as spontaneous emission. And when the electron is taken to the excited state, and all of a sudden it makes a transition to the ground state, no purpose is served. It is useless. Simply the electron goes to the, it is something like going to the, uh, some place, a new place, and within no time returning from that, you will not enjoy the stay there. And it's the same, the electron at once, when it is making a transition, whatever the electron that is uh, released cannot be, sorry, the energy that is released cannot be utilized. So it has to be used properly. And in order to do, do that, So any absorption results in excitation. In the slide, you can see when the electron is uh, electron absorbs energy, it will be taken to the excited state. So stimulated absorption results in excitation. We say that atom is in the excited state, or we say the electron is in the excited state, or it is taken to the excited state. As spontaneous spontaneous emission of the photon, the spontaneous emission, the electron is not emitted. Emission of the photon, absorption of photon, emission of photon. The photon is being absorbed by the electron and the photon is emitted from the electron, added to the electron, taken away from the electron. So the major role here is the photon is entering the scene and exiting the scene. So this results in emission. In the first case, it results in the Absorption, thereby it is excitation, whereas in the second stage, we say it is it results in the emission. So the transition here, when the electron is taken to the excited state and makes a transition, do you know what is the time that is elapsed? Time taken for this electron to go to the excited state and then come to the ground state, we say it is very, very small. We say it is maybe one second, no. One tenth of a second, no. It is of the order of 10 to the power 
minus 8 second very very small negligibly small almost the electron remains in the same place so we don't find the electron we did not feel it as though the electron is taken to the excited state and come to the ground state we feel that the electron was as though it remains in the same state because the time is very very small in order to make the electron to transit slowly that means in order to re reduce the time sorry in order to increase the time in order to increase the time we make use of some optically active medium thereby the there would be one more energy state that is introduced in between don't feel it is uh, some obstacle or some wall being constructed it is only as a state the electron can remain here it can go to this while making the return trip the electron is not directly coming to the ground state on the other hand it goes to the new state which we call it as metastable state metastable state metastable so what is the purpose of introducing this metastable state means in order to delay the program in order to delay because here the time taken is 10 to the power minus minus 8 second whereas the electron first stage is this is the first stage electron will be taken from the excited state to the ground uh, metastable state then the electron is made to transit from the metastable state to the ground state and the time for which it is the time taken is of the order of 10 to the power minus 3 it is considerably larger time interval we say it is in the order of millisecond whereas here it is not even in microsecond it is still smaller than that so going to the excited state come back directly the time taken is of the order of 10 to the power minus 8 second whereas if it goes to a via via media that is there is one more uh, level one more stage which we call it as metastable state if it transits from the excited state to the uh, you know, metastable state then to the ground state the time taken will be very large, with, uh, considerably larger, and thereby, whatever the emission that takes place, the energy that is released can be utilized properly. Not only that, we find one more thing which we call it as stimulated emission. Spontaneous emission is different from stimulated emission. So, that also I can explain with the help of the slide. Now, you can have a look at the slide there. Now, the electron, it is in the ground state. Here we can see the electron is in the ground state. Electron, it is in the ground state. Now, first stage, somebody is entering there. There is a photon is entering the scene. And because of that, its main purpose is to excite the electron. It will lift the electron to the excited state. This is the first stage. Photon entering the scene, and thereby electron is taken to the excited state. It is not the end of it and the electron is not allowed to transit directly because of some optically active medium we have introduced one more stage forcefully the electron has to make a transition it is something like diverting the route if some accident or anything happens in a railway track or anything main line may not be intact as it is there will be some problem and it will be forced to go in some other route and in the same way, here there is some other route thereby the electron, instead of making a transition directly, it will go to the metastable state. We find electron first stage, it is only excitation. Absorption is there, result of it is only excitation. Next is the electron made to transit from excited state to meta metastable state during this uh, state this gap is not very large the gap is not very large it is almost side by side but in my diagram i have shown it a little bit farther in order to understand the diagram in order to understand the transition and here there is no doubt a small difference in the energy which is of the order of thermal energy which we call it as non-radiating transition. So here we find non-radiating transition. And during this transition, no photon is emitted. Whereas when the electron now, it makes a transition from metastable state to the ground state. So here, 
electron is in the metastable state. It makes a transition. During this transition, energy is released, which is almost equal to the electron, the photon, which was incident earlier. No much variation. In my diagram, it appears as though the energy is considerably larger. It is not so. The, elect the photon, incoming photon, and the finally emitting the photon will have the same amount of energy. So these are these, some of the important points that one has to remember in order to understand laser. So this is what we call it a spontaneous emission. During this spontaneous emission, we know very well there is emission of photon. So you can see this. So this non-radiating transition. Now this is transition wherein which photon is emitted. A spontaneous emission which results in emission of a photon. Let me tell you what is happening there. And later on, there is one more uh, important aspect that will be introduced in addition to the explanation given so far. So here, the first stage, entry of the photon, it is absorbed by the electron, it is taken to the excited state, which is not a temp uh, permanent stage, it is only resulting in the excitation of the electron. The electron now, it makes, I'm giving a running commentary, you can follow that. The electron makes a transition from the ground state, it reaches the metastable state, it is a non-radiating transition. Am I right? Non-radiating transition, in which no radiation is emitted. And now the electron is feeling free to make a transition from the metastable state. And during this stage, one more important aspect is introduced. Here we are introducing or seeing one more hero in the scene, which is different from the energy already possessed by the electron. Electron already possesses amount of energy. It is about to release the energy. And during that time, during that transition from the metastable state to the ground state, one more photon of same energy is made to incident. Let us see what is happening there. So as this enters, electron make a transition and simultaneously the incoming electron and the electron which is produced, which we call it as the emitted electron, the electron being emitted from the metastable transition during metastable state to ground state, both of them will move together. The beauty in this is the incoming photon and the emitted photon will have same energy, same phase, same direction. In other words, they are identical in all the respects. It is something like twins. Sometimes we find some twins. We cannot make out the difference at all. And here we have a, a formation of twins. One incoming, the other one because of the transition. And those two electrons, sorry, those two photons which are formed, it is the process what we call it as stimulated emission. So here we have stimulated emission. During stimulated emission, what happens? During the time of transition from the metastable state to the ground state, one more photon is entering the scene, thereby two photons, they are formed. And those two photons can be made to fall on a reflecting surface. Why it is so? Let me explain that. Because without this ex explanation, basic explanation, we cannot explain laser. So the first one, we say that the electron is taken from the ground state to the excited state, where in which energy is absorbed. Electron is transited from, transition means moving from the excited state to the metastable state without emission of energy, without loss of much, much of energy. And when it travels, it transits from metastable state to ground state, one more additional photon is introduced, which will be exactly similar to matching exactly, in other words, they are exactly 100% identical to the electron, the photon which is going to be emitted. And whatever the, for, the process that is for, uh, taken place, we call it as stimulated emission, stimulated emission. The electron, no, no doubt, it will make a transition automatically, but at the same time, we are stimulating the electron. We are creating a situation for the electron to transit. In other words, we are motivating the electron to transit from the metastable to ground state by incidenting one more photon. These two photons will be emitted. 
And this process, if we know the basic, then let us understand what is going to happen and what are the other stages that is found in a laser. So let us say we have, it is a summary of what has happened here. The electron excited to the, uh, it is taken to the excited state, make a transition. And when it travels from or transits from metastable state to ground state, we find stimulated emission being taken place. And after this, if we introduce, so this is another phenomenon which we call it as population inversion. So here we find one electron is taken to the excited state, it is taken to the uh, metastable state. Another is, is taken to the excited state. It is also so like that. We find more and more electrons from the ground state are lifted up, are promoted, and they are placed at metastable state for the stimulated emission. We are preparing the electron, more and more and more electrons from the ground state. They are taken to the excited state, and later on they are taken to the metastable state. That means we are preparing many more electrons, more and more electrons, plenty of electrons in the metastable state, thereby not only one emission, of, sorry, transition of one electron, there will be many electrons transiting at a time, which leads to several photons. So to say, when one transition taken, takes place from metastable state to ground state, let me explain it on the board. So here, this is uh, excited state, this is uh, metastable state, and this is a ground state. So we make the electron, one electron is taken, and it is, that means we cannot take the electron to the metastable state directly, it is impossible. Whereas more and more electrons which are present there are taken to the, in other words, we are taking up the electron. That means we are striking the electrons in the metastable state. So one, when one electron is transiting from the metastable state to ground state, two photons are produced. That means one entering there and as a result, two photons. In case if two electrons are transiting, there will be emission of four photons. If there is an emission of four, photon, four electrons, then in other words, one will be changed to two, two will be increased to four, four will be increased to eight, eight will be increased to 16, and so on and so forth. That means within no time, it is not a slow process, it is a rapid process, the process. Within no time, plenty of electrons will be emitted. It is something like atomic explosion, atom bomb. It is because of the nuclear fission that is taking place in a random, sorry, in a rapid manner. Not only one atom is getting uh, uh, broken up at a time, plenty of, that means innumerable number of atoms producing emission which is called as a tremendous or the enormous amount of energy, which causes some dangerous effects. Okay, in the same way, it is not the dangerous ray effect, but light is said to be amplified. That means instead of one photon, one photon is doubled, again it is doubled, again it is doubled and so on. We find within no time, number of photons are available and there we say the light is said to be amplified. And now it will be very clear, I suppose, light, Laser, it is a light. That means we are incidenting a photon. And it is very similar to, you can just uh, have a comparison with a mic. So when we have, or when we speak something in front of a mic, and there we are going to keep something, a box, wherein which the sound is amplified. And there we are using electronic devices, electronic amplifiers, wherein which a feeble sound can be made to amplify that by innumerable number of people can here, it may be a political function, or it may be a religious function, or any other human, it may be a class college function also. There, the sound is amplified, and thereby many people can hear it at a time, where in which we say the sound is amplified, whereas here it is the light is amplified. Whatever the input that is given, because of a smaller input, we get a very large output. So light is amplified. What is the process? This is not leading to, this is not essential or major role. No doubt it is essential. Without this, it cannot be stimulated. It has to be taken there, but the major part is from transition, transition of electron from metastable state to
ground state. That means more and more electron, as more and more electrons are transited, at the same time, more and more photons are incidented and they get doubled up and the output will be nothing but laser. So laser, and in order to do that, we say that the electrons have to be piled up. And this process, we call it as population inversion. What is population inversion? The electron at the not uh, sorry, the electrons under uh, normal condition they will be found in the ground state. But our aim is to bring the electrons. More and more electrons should be crowded, and they should be ready for the transition. And that is possible only when you take the electrons to the excited state. From there, they will make a transition, which is known as the population inversion. So instead of making the electrons to be present in the ground state, more and more, and more electrons are taken to the metastable state. So the process, the tendency is changed. In those days, people, many people, they used to be present in the farm because many of the uh, children, they used to stay in the villages. But now, villages, uh, are the farmers, they are finding it difficult because all children, they study well, they become engineers, they doc they're doctors, and they don't study, sorry, stay in the villages, even though if it is their own, they are present elsewhere in the metropolitan cities and so on. And the farmers, they are really in trouble because all are taken to the higher positions. Nobody is ready to go for farming. So the same sort of comparison I'm giving here. So the electrons are available, many more electrons instead of ground state, more electrons are made available in the metastable state, thereby laser activity is promoted or it is activated. And such a phenomenon, we call it as population inversion. What is population inversion? Instead of keeping the electrons in the ground state, more and more electrons are taken to the excited state. In turn, they come to the metastable state. The phenomenon, the process, the method, we call it as population inversion. How it is possible? Not by heating or not by threatening the electrons to go. It is only by incidenting the electrons. The electrons, sorry, the photons are made incident on the electrons or the atom as a whole. Thereby, the electrons are taken and the population inversion is created, is formed. The situation is formed because of incidenting the light. And therefore, this phenomenon is called optical pumping. Optical pumping, it is nothing but a phenomenon wherein which light of suitable frequency exactly equal to the difference in the energy. When light of suitable frequency is made incident, more and more electrons will be taken to the excited state and in turn, they will come to the metastable state. In turn, they can produce laser and the process we call it as optical pumping. So now it is very clear what is the uh, inside stimulated. The first one we call it as a stimulated emission, sorry, stimulated absorption, and the spontaneous. This is stimulated absorption. This is spontaneous emission. Here there is an absorption of uh, photon, here there is an emission of photon. Whereas the third one, the third possibility is this is a metastable state. Here we are incidenting one photon, electron from the metastable state makes a transition to the ground state. At the same time, two photons. So this will be removed from the scene or it will disappear or it will not it will be shown. Here we will be concentrating only on the two photons which are formed during this transition, which we call it as stimulated emission. This is a stimulated. This is. Uh, absorption, stimulated absorption, spontaneous emission, and this is stimulated emission. These are the three different uh, phenomena one has to remember in while studying laser. So here we find that electron making a transition from the excited state to the ground state, and there we find the number of electrons, they are already available in the metastable state. It is something like getting ready for the war. Many more people are crowded near the uh, uh, boundaries. Okay, border security forces, many people are crowded near the 
border whenever the warp takes place. And it's the same way, more and more electrons are taken to the metastable state and the electron which are present there can make a transition, more and more electrons make a transition. So here this is called amplification. What do you mean by amplification? We studied what is known as the stimulated emission. Now let us explain what is amplification. Amplification is possible. So we are now ready for stimulated emission. Photon enters the scene. So the two photons are formed and the two photons, they are made to incident on some reflecting surface, maybe some mirror and they get reflected. So the two photons are available. Those two photons in turn, they move towards and it stimulates two more photons, thereby four photons are formed. And similarly, if you keep one more uh, reflector on the other side, four photons will be incident there and four photons must be available for that, thereby eight photons will be formed like that innumerable number of photons can be produced. In other words, we say the light is amplified and this phenomenon, we call it as amplification of light. Stimulated emission. It is a simulated emission wherein which it is not only one phase, several phases, several times it moves uh, to and fro, thereby for every trip it, uh, it gets doubled up. That is the simplest uh, way we can remember. One electron, that by two, sorry, one photon enters there because of that two photons are formed, two photons get reflected and four photons are formed, four photons get reflected and there during the uh, spontaneous emission or the, sorry, the stimulated emission, eight of the photons are formed and so on and so forth, it get, gets multiplied or doubled up. So what is optical pumping? Already I told you, it is a phenomenon of achieving population inversion population inversion it is in we are inverting we are totally changing the situation the example which i gave is nothing but the village where in which many people are taken to the other places and thereby village the strength is population is reduced and people are found crowded in cities like bangalore and so on so optical pumping it is a process of achieving population inversion the method of causing population inversion by light is known as optical pumping. So optical pumping, in order to, so the main idea of optical pumping is to have population inversion. That means more and more electrons are made available in the metastable state. It is formed by incidenting suitable photons and such a phenomenon, we call it as optical pumping, very similar to pumping water from the sump to your overhead tank. It is very simple by using a simple mechanical device, whereas here the device is not there, pump is not there, but the method is there, pumping, lifting from the ground state to the excited state in turn to the... Okay, what are the properties of laser? So laser, it is different from the ordinary light. Laser, it is less divergent. So when you have a laser torch, you might have played with a laser torch also, and even laser lights are available. There, the beam of light rays, they will be almost parallel even if they travel several kilometers, several thousands of kilometers also. That means they don't get diverged. Whereas if you use ordinary torch, the light rays will be diverged. In other words, the cross-section area will increase, but here the cross-section area will be almost the same. Therefore, we say it is less divergent. This is one of the important questions several times we find in your question paper. What are the major properties of laser? The first one, we say it is less divergent. You can remember the figure and you can write the answer on your wall. When you incident, when you incident, sunlight, that is white light into a prism, we find a band of colors. In other words, we say it is a dispersion. Means white light consists of its constituent colors with Gaia and thereby all colors, they uh, refract to different extent. And when they fall on a screen, we can get spectrum. Whereas if you use, if you use uh, 
A laser, one a small narrow beam of laser is made incident on a prism. The outcoming of the emitted radiation will have the same color. Means there is no dispersion. So to say, the entering and the exit is one and the same. The entering and the exit have the same frequency, same wavelength, single wavelength, which we call it as monochromatic. Mono means single, chroma, chroma means color, single color. Laser lights will not have different colors. It will have a single frequency. Whatever may be the type of radiation, whatever may be the type of uh, laser that is produced, it will be having a single wave or a single wavelength, single type of waves. Highly coherent. A simple example which can be quoted for a coherence is marching. You might have seen this RD parade, Republic Day parades, where in which we cannot make out a small difference also whenever the soldiers or the cadets, NCC cadets or the persons who are participating in the march. We don't find any small difference, minor difference also cannot be noticed even in the slow motion. There we say they vibrate or they move in phase. The distance is maintained, the speed is maintained, and in the same way, here we have the wave pattern I've shown in the slide. We find the wave pattern, all waves are identical, all waves will have the same wavelength, same frequency, same time period, same velocity. In other words, all waves are identical and therefore we say they propagate, they move in phase and they are highly coherent. When we say they are in phase, they are highly coherent. Coherent means no much difference. Whereas we find people walking on the street or during some festival season and all, people will not be marching. Instead, there will be a random motion, what we find in the next uh, slide. So there is one coherent, uh, coherent waves, the other one is non-coherent waves. Lasers, they come under the first category, namely highly coherent. So major problem in properties, it is less divergent, it is highly coherent. Then we say that they are highly intense also, intense radiation, intense beam. So these are the properties of lasers. Now coming to the applications of laser, Lasers, they are used in barcodes in many of the malls. Nowadays, we frequently visit there. They don't refer the bill and other things. Automatically, you'll be fed to your computer and you'll be given GST also accordingly. So the barcodes are read with the help of laser beam. Number one application. Number two, it is used in surveying. Those days, people say civil people, uh, people they use theodolites, dumpy levels and all and so on, which is uh, based on the ordinary light, they'll be seeing it. But now they are making use of laser and within no time their work will be done without much difficulty. So laser is used in surveying also. Laser is used in endoscopy. This is a medical application. The internal part of a human organs can be photographed or it can be analyzed or it can be diagnosed with the help of uh, the method which we call it as endoscopy, wherein which they're, they're using la laser beam. Laser is used in communication, telecommunication, as well as transferring data in uh, computers and so on. So it is used in com uh, communications. Laser is used in medical field, which is nothing but your dentistry. Dentists, they make use of laser gun in order to make of minute holes in the uh, a tooth in order to remove a small portion, minute portions, where in which where there is a formation of cavity in order to fill it up, they dig it properly. For that, they make use of laser. Not only that, laser is used in eye surgery also, where in which sometimes there will be a retina. If it is detached, they, you know, the eye specialist, they make use of laser beam and they will attach the detached retina in order to remove the cataract also they make use of laser it is used in cosmetics where in which the unwanted uh, acne we call it as it can be removed or even some unwanted growth of hair in the facial portion can be removed using laser beam it is used in recording and uh, reproduction of sound whatever the CDs or DVDs that we are using, the recording, we don't know what is happening there, but this is what's happening. We are using 
laser beam in order to record the sound as well as video not only recording reproduction if it is only recorded and if it is not reproduced it is of no use both for recording as well as for reproduction we use lasers and lasers are used very well you know nowadays it is quite famous we are using laser in printing also it may be any document or it may be a picture also laser printers are available in plenty lasers they are used this is the industrial application laser can be used to cut metals not only metals even in leather industries a pile of uh, leather can be uh, made to or it will be cut with the help of a beam of a narrow beam of laser it can be made to cut paper or uh, leather or metal and in case of metal minute holes can be drilled and even a fine finished cutting portion can be formed by my making use of laser so this is a simple diagram wherein which we find identical portions being cut with the help of laser beam laser is used in holography the three dimensional photography which is quite common three dimension whatever the photograph that we are using and even in whatever the picture that you are seeing in your mobile it is only two dimension but the three dimensional photographies are, are also available which we call them as hologram and in order to get the photography or a photograph in three dimension we use not ordinary light we use laser beams so some more applications are there now coming to the next topic which we call it as nanotechnology so this is also quite interesting very large but let me make it as simple as as small as possible nanotechnology after a few years this will rule the world so what are the size of a room if you think of a size of the room we say it is in terms of few meters three meters four meters what are the distance between between one place to another place for example uh, you know uh, bangalore to chennai it may be around uh, 3 350 or 400 or 500 whatever it is then we see it is in terms of kilometer kilo means in terms of uh, three meters room it may be of the order of few meters two meters ten meters and so on sometimes we use a uh, scale ordinary scale for measuring the length of the straight line or whatever the dimensions which you are using for your engineering drawing which is expressed in centimeter or it may be in terms of meter so meter one itself centi minus two milli 10 to the power minus three similarly we have micrometers micro 10 to the power minus six means one divided by one followed by Ten lakhs. In other words, one meter is divided into 10, 10 lakhs. Then each part we call it as micrometer. Micrometer. Now it is there in your mind. But still going further, if it is of the order of ten to the power minus nine, ten to the power minus nine. We call this as nanometer one nanometer one micrometer one millimeter one centimeter so one followed by one followed by nine zeros one two three four five six seven eight nine so if you divide one meter into so many parts each part we call it as nanometer and we have a technology dealing with the substances of this dimension very very small very small not even the size of your uh, cell, animal cell or a plant cell, still smaller than that. If you think of a technology and engineering with the help of this type of meter or this type of dimension, which varies from one nanometer to 100 nanometer, we have a new field of science, which we call it as nanotechnology. So several definitions are there. Now we can take this as a standard definition. In most of the cases we find that nanotechnology is a branch of technology. 
nanotechnology is a branch of technology that deals with dimensions and the tolerance. The tolerance means we say that order or the differences, whatever we find, the range, in other words, dimensions and tolerance less than 100 nanometers, especially manipulating of the individual atom and molecules. So nanotechnology, whenever you talk about nanotechnology, we are not talking in terms of the size of the room or the size of the atom. Still, in other words, we say it is in the order of the size of the atom, not in the size of a building or a scale or a diagram, whatever you are using. Very, very small objects of a very small dimension, which is of the order of nanometers. And whatever the new technology that is formed, we call it as nanotechnology. Here we have a first glance. So some objects, animal cell, it is of the order of micrometers. They are in the order of micrometers. Whereas the fluorescent proteins, they are of the order of 10 nanometers. Colloidal gold, colloids, we say it is minute uh, particles of gold. It is of the order of 100 nanometers. So nanoscience and nanotechnology are the study and application of extremely small things and can be used across all other scientific fields. Which are the scientific fields? It may be physics, it may be chemistry, it may be biology, it may be material science, or it may be a constructing field, construction engineering, or any other mechanical engineer, anything. After a few years, this will govern the world, I said. So, this is a new technology having very small objects or dealing with the small objects, engineering with the small objects is simply termed as nanotechnology. So nanotechnology, the father of uh, nanotechnology is Richard Feynman because he studied uh, or gave the idea, in other words, he fulfilled the formation of uh, nanoparticles, size is very small of the order of 10 to the power minus 9 meters. So today scientists and engineers are finding wide variety of ways to deliberately make materials at nanoscale to take advantages of enhanced properties. So the main, main purpose of using nanotechnology is to minimize the cost, to minimize the size, at the same time increasing, increasing the strength. It should be very light. At the same time, it should be very strong. And we have certain types of nanoparticles, nano objects, which are helping us in order to achieve this. So to say, we can minimize, say, for example, if we have a tennis racket, if it is heavy, it may not be easy for the players to handle. If you want to make it light, it may not be strong. But we are fulfilling these two conditions. It should be made as light as possible. At the same time, it should be made as strong as possible. It is possible by making use of the new technology, which we call it as nanotechnology. So here I highlighted this higher strength, lighter weight, and increase the control of light spectrum and greater chemical activities. So the main chemical activities, it plays a major role in our medicine. Nanoparticles, they are used in nanomedicines. So when we talk about the applications, we'll study that. So nanotechnology, what are the advantages of nanotechnology? Nanotechnology, we have certain types of objects, which we call them as nanotubes and nanoparticles. Nanotubes and nanoparticles, which are tubes and particles of only a few atomic size. You know what is atom? I might have drawn on the figure a board full of, of uh, you know, atom. Atom is not so big. It is very small. Even it cannot be seen through your uh, microscope, but it can be seen through the advanced microscope, which we call it as tunneling microscope. And the size of the particle is few atoms. It is something like keeping marble. That is a simple comparison. If you take one nanometer as the size of, if you take one nanometer, this is, one nanometer as the size of a marble or a peanut, then what will be the size of one meter? One meter will be your earth. 
we can just have a comparison. One nanometer is one marble. One meter will be almost equal to the size of the earth. So, keeping a few atoms side by side and making a simple lump, a collection, whatever the objects that are formed, we call them as nanotubes. And there are certain particles which we call them as nanoparticles. And we are making use of some simple engines, machines, with the help of such a tiny particles, which we call them as nano engines. So this is a nanotube. There we find arrangement of carbon atoms in single layer. And when this is added to some other material like building and other things, it gives extra strength and it is much stronger than much stronger than iron we say it is almost 100 times stronger than steel at the same time weight is almost one sixth of the you know the uh, weight of iron it is uh, lighter because we in the beginning itself i told you there are two possibilities the two purpose to make it as lighter lighter as possible, at the same time, as stronger as possible. So in order to achieve that, we construct what we call the mass nanotubes. It's also now coming under the nanotubes, a simple structure in order to give you a simple idea. In addition, nano robo, nano robots, tiny robots, very small, microscopic, are still smaller than that. Micro, uh, you know, robo are being form they are used mainly in medicine because they can be controlled just like using uh, some remote uh, wake you know uh, toys in the same way robo can be can, you know can be can, uh, can be controlled by using a new technology and they can be di directed to the place wherever it is necessary especially injecting the nano robo into your body and it can reach the required place especially the person suffering from uh, cancer cells. So those robots can reach that place. I'll show you the diagram. It will really reach the place and it will destroy the unwanted cells and thereby the person can be cured. So this is something like a small insect. It is not an insect, it is a robo, a tiny robo. And it will be directed to reach the places wherever the cells, the unwanted cells are uh, present, they will accumulate there. Not only one, maybe a number of uh, ro uh, nano robots can be made to accumulate and they will eat away, they will destroy or kill the unwanted cells. It is likely that nanotechnology will make solar powers. The solar power, with the help of solar powers, we can minimize the size of the solar power, but the efficiency can be increased, the weight can be decreased. These are the main advantages of nanotechnology. So it is likely that nanotechnology will make solar power more economical by reducing the cost of construction, solar panels and the related equipments. As a result, the energy stored storage capacity, it can be increased several times and the efficiency can be increased, whereas the cost can be minimized as possible. So nanotechnology will also open up a new method of generating and storing energy. Mainly, people will be suffering from uh, a small defect, which is nothing but the use of batteries. It is getting discharged very quickly. Later on, after a few years, we may find batteries. If you charge, sometimes I don't know, but I believe that it can be extended for a few weeks or a few days. So charging, that is the storage capacity, can be increased. Nanotechnology has a potential to bring major advance in medicine. Nano medicines are available. It can reach only the affected portion. It can be uh, it can be controlled, and it will be very small. But at the same time, it will have more effect. When you use some ordinary me medicine, sometimes it may affect the uh, cells which are in good condition. Whereas if you use this uh, nano medicines, they can go to the place wherever it is necessary and it can destroy the unwanted cells. Nanobot could be sent into the patient's arteries. That means it can be sent into the blood vessels. You can just imagine what may be the size. It is not very big. 
it is very very small very microscopic or less than microscopic and thereby they can easily enter the uh, blood cells along with the blood and it can reach the affected portion and any sort of uh, treatment that is needed can be made with the help of nano robots so surgery could be could become much faster and more accurate because everything is computerized and it will be controlled by supercomputers and uh, operations only the doctors they will not use their uh, ordinary uh, devices or instruments or equipments they'll use only the robots and they will carry out the operations successfully and injuries will be very very small it will not ca cause any side effect it may become possible to heal genetic conditions and uh, replacing the damaged genes this is only biology let us not break our head nanotechnology could also be used in refining to refine drug production tailoring drug it is something like a person unusual uh, uh, size person for him dress may not be available in the market he has to go to the tailor and uh, get to stitch as far as uh, requirement sometimes even the shoes also like that and in the same way drugs whatever it is available may not be suitable for a particular disease and in such cases the uh, medicine can be tailor made it can be suitable for that particular person for that particular disease with the help of the new coming uh, technology which is using nano medicines tailoring drugs at a molecular level very small level you know, uh, possibilities because as you make smaller and smaller the area becomes much higher and higher as we break, break a bigger one bigger stone into smaller crushed particles the surface area will increase the effect will become more more effective and reduce the side effects more seriously it is possible that nanotechnology could be weaponized this is for uh, defense purpose atomic weapons something like controlling a missile atomic weapons can be uh, targeted or it can be projected and it can attack only the required portion by monitoring monitoring it and we call it as a smart bullet smart bullet it can be controlled and it is very minute nobody can detect it unless and until you have the receiver or a detector if it is not detected it can be easily affect the enemy's uh, portion or enemy's land or enemy's uh, camp so atomic weapons could be easily be created and novel weapons might also be developed one possibility is that so called smart bullet a computerized bullet very important here computerized bullet that could be controlled and aimed very accurately because there won't be much variation the target it will be definite and it will be uh, attacked accurately these developments it is advantage for the defense as a whole as a for a nation but at the same time if it happens to reach the uh, terrorist and other uh, socially evil people they may cause some unwanted damages to the society also nanotechnology is used for nanoscale transistors it is in technology in your electrical sorry electricity or uh, electronics the size of the transistors and other, other equipments can be minimized the cost can be minimized but at the same time the effect can be increased and the power consumption will be minimized as small as possible and sooner sooner we will be uh, making use of computers where in which very large memories can be stored in a very small chip so there is advantage of nanotechnology nanotechnology improves the display screens nowadays what are the display screens that is there after some time there will be a drastic change in the screen the efficiency can be increased the hardness or the strength it will be durable and so on one of the biggest advantage of the world is facing because of nanotechnology is the lack of employment that means once this nanotechnology is formed uh, many of the people will lose their job that is a drawback that is found and some of the sectors has to be forcefully be closed nanotechnology has increased the risk in the health also nano particles due to their small size can cause inhalation problem that means very small it can be easily enter your body not only your body it can enter your brain also and it may cause some fatal effect in some cases 
that means it is disadvantage mass poisoning could happen only if coating on the product that nanotechnology is to produce include poisonous micro particles that can penetrate into the brain so it can pollute the atmosphere it can pollute your atmosphere it can cause pollution in the air it can cause pollution in the water because the nanoparticle nobody can see it we may say that it is crystal clear it is very pure and so on but if any nanoparticle is mixed it cannot be detected very easily so there is a much danger is also awaited so technology has to be taken care of in order to prevent the pollution we have so many other pollutions we are finding it difficult to minimize them but at the same time we have one more uh, uh, pollution agent which is called you know waiting for us to cause some destruction that has to be taken care my dear students i thank you for this uh, opportunity and uh, your uh, presence and if you have any doubts you can ask me